All right, good morning, everybody. I'll call the order of the regularly scheduled Board of Supervisors meeting for this Tuesday, December 11th, 2018. Clearly, we've got a packed agenda. We're going to be here as long as you guys want to be here, okay? But we do have business that we've got to work on, uh, work on and work through. We're going to start this meeting just like we start every one of our meetings by honoring America with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you in the morning. So appreciate everybody's interest in, in we've got really two big topics today. One that's driving uh, most of the attendance, but, but two, three major topics. We're going to get through the business portion of our agenda first today. We'll, we should be able to answer that fairly quickly. Then we'll move on to the Dotson proposed rezoning, try to deal with that as quickly as we can, and then we'll move on to the public hearing for the three proposed uh, animal feeding lots. Um, so that's going to be our process today. Our first item on the agenda, as always, is public comment number one. So this is an opportunity for members of the public in every meeting to comment on really anything they want to comment on. What I'm going to ask of you is, if you have comments on either of the topics that we're having a public hearing on, please hold your comments till we get to the public hearing. If anybody would like to address any other topic other than those, those items, please come on up to the microphone right now and, and address us. And seeing no one moving the microphone, we'll move on to consideration of minutes from December 4th. I do as presented. Second. Motion and a second. Olson. Aye. Chitty. Aye. Sanders, aye. Personnel actions as listed for. Motion to move as presented. Second. Uh, motion and a second. Chitty. Aye. Olson. Aye. Sanders, aye. Claims for December 13th. I move as presented. Aye. Uh, Okay, so we've got a motion and a second on the claims for December 13th. Olson? Aye. Chitty? Aye. Sanders? Aye. Consent agenda, board, please pull item number six, which is consideration of a request from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources to award a construction contract for Hickory Grove. That's something that I felt like we needed to talk about. I've asked them to come back next week since our agenda is full. So I'd like to pull number six and deal with that next week. <laughs> You, how about if you move the consent agenda? Uh, we uh, the vote to the consent agenda minus uh, item six for next week's agenda. I second. Motion and a second. Shitty. Aye. Uh, Olson. Aye. Sanders. Aye. Consent agenda passes with the removal of item number six. That brings us to public hearing items. Uh, first on our public hearing items is first consideration of ordinance 280, which amends certain boundaries of the official zoning map of Stone County. <coughs> And resolution 1947, which is our C2C, which is our comprehensive plan, future land use map amendment. Uh, we're going to start with planning and development, Jerry and Emily, to give us a full report on this. Then we're going to hear from the applicant. Then we'll open the public hearing. Jerry. Thank you, Rick. We just want to start by thanking the applicant for their descriptive written application, sharing their vision for the property and the goal to protect the natural resources on the property and also including the concept development plan that they submitted with the rezoning application. The applicant had meaningful discussions uh, with our staff and the Story County Conservation Board about how the conservation staff uh, might be involved in the management and ownership of these natural areas or environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, and their submittal and the discussions that we had with the applicant and the discussions that we had with the Story County uh, conservation staff helped shape the recommendation with the conditions that we bring forward to the board today. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission did address the rezoning request at the December 5 meeting. They had a lot of good questions, discussion, they listened to the comments from the general public, and um, however, they were unable to reach a consensus, and so there is no recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission on this item. So our goal today is to go through the main points that are identified in the uh, Surrey County Land Development Regulations, Zoning Ordinance, and the Cornerstone to Capstone Comprehensive Plan uh, for rezoning request to assist the board in making their decision. Uh, this is a rezoning and C2C uh, future land use map amendment. The applicant is Chris Friedrich. Uh, the property owner uh, is 
of Robert Batson, the Batson Family Trust. Uh, the subject property is located in Section 7 of Franklin Township, uh, on the south side of 170th Street and the east side of 500th Avenue. Um, the city of Gilbert is in, within two miles of the proposed um, rezoning. Uh, the districts we have um, for this property are the Gilbert Fire Association, Mary Greeley Ambulance, Story County Sheriff, the Gilbert Community School District, Midland Power Cooperative, and Xenia Rural Water. So the nature of the request um, is for a um, rezoning from the A1 Agricultural District to the R1 Transitional Residential District. The C2C Future Land Use Map Amendment um, proposal is from the agricultural conservation area and the natural resource area to the rural residential area designation. Uh, the subject property is approximately 160 gross acres or quarter quarters. Uh, the request has been submitted to accommodate a proposed major residential subdivision to be located primarily in the northwest, northeast, and southeast quarter quarters. Um, applicant has provided a concept drawing that includes 81 development lots mm -hmm. for one single family dwelling per lot. So looking at uh, the vicinity map, we're in the northwestern <laughs> corner of Franklin Township. Um, the subject property is one and a half miles west of the city of Gilbert. Looking at surrounding land use, the land use is primarily agricultural and large lot residential. Um, the Buck Hill subdivision is a third of a mile to the north <coughs> on the west side of 500th Avenue in Boone County. Eagle Ridge subdivision is a quarter of a mile uh, to the south um, in Story County on the east side of 500th Avenue. Uh, looking at the Squaw Creek floodplain that runs through this property, uh, it runs around the western sides and then also on uh, the southwest quarter quarter um, and to the south of the subject property. Uh, Eagle Ridge subdivision is located directly to the south of this floodplain. Uh, so um, because development is strongly discouraged within the floodplain, um, we might um, consider Eagle Ridge to be uh, surrounding to the subject property. There are five single family dwellings within a quarter mile. And these are located on lots uh, between 6.88 net acres and 53.4 net acres in size. So the current use of the property, uh, 66 acres is a long-term um, pasture, and that starts in the northwest corner here and extends uh, down eastward and southern. Uh, the farm area, um, there's currently um, 25 acres in hay production in the northeast corner and 19 acres that were in corn production in 2018. Um, the, there is um, an area that has been seeded, or seeded to long-term prairie, two areas, um, one in the northwest corner of the subject property, and then a majority of the southwest quarter quarter. Um, the remainder of the stream uh, is stream channel um, and uh, natural area. This information was provided to us by Fox Engineering. This is the general concept plan submitted by Fox Engineering and the applicant. Um, again, there are 81 lots um, in the northwest quarter quarter, the northeast quarter quarter, and the southeast quarter quarter. There's no residential development plan for the flood plain area or the natural areas in the southwest. Looking at the zoning map, this property is zone A1 um, and is completely surrounded by A1 zoning. Um, Eagle Ridge subdivision to the south is zone AR, um, and then further, just slightly further south, is the wood subdivision, which is uh, zone R1. Again, uh, the subject property is located here with a floodplain to the south and Eagle Ridge subdivision uh, directly to the south. Uh, so the existing um, zoning on the property is A1 Agricultural District. Um, this is for land use is compatible with agriculture uh, and to protect agri agricultural land from encroachment of urban <coughs> land uses. Um, a goal is to preserve rural character by limiting development of most new non-farm dwellings to large lots. Uh, 
the proposed district, the R1 Transitional Residential District, is for single-family detached dwellings between a rural and an urban density. Um, and part of that is providing special provisions to protect the residential character of the district. Just looking at um, a few of the highlights from the C2C plan uh, designations, the existing designation is an um, agricultural conservation area. So that's um, conserving agricultural land, encouraging high value agricultural lands to remain as agriculture, limiting conflicts, um, and promoting the continued health of agriculture. The rural residential designation um, involves principles such as <coughs> new development sensitive to the predominantly rural area of the county, um, encouraging clustering of residential sites, providing buffers to minimize conflicts, um, and mitigating and managing stormwater runoff, erosion control, and wastewater discharge. This is our C2C future land use map um, designation. As I said uh, previously, <coughs> the uh, subject property is designated as A1 Agriculture, <coughs> where you can see the aerial image. Um, we also have a natural resource uh, layer um, that is quite general on this site. It does indicate to us, um, while not very specific, it does indicate up to us that there are natural resources on the site. Um, principles for the natural resource area uh, include mitigating impacts of proposed development, discouraging development uh, within these areas, considering um, areas identified as natural resource area for inclusion in the Greenbelt Conservation Zoning District, So due to the generality of the natural resource area map and also discussions that took place at the conceptual review meeting, um, it was requested by Story County Conservation that a, um, a field survey be done on the site. Uh, Dr. Thomas Rossberg uh, from Drake University um, did this, this survey in, on October 15th of this year. Um, it was a primary, primarily a late season plant survey, so um, really was just looking at what was on the site uh, on that date. Um, in the report, uh, Dr. Rothberg uh, concludes the following. Um, there is a significant native prairie component on the site. The south and west facing slopes are the most important locations supporting the prairie remnant populations. And finally, the full extent of the quality of the prairie remnants cannot be fully determined at this point due to the lateness in the growing season. So here are the um, locations of the identified species. Um, they're located primarily on steep slopes, again, on the western um, sides and the southern uh, slopes of the property. <coughs> this is just some more detail about the identified species. Um, looking at the oblique imagery, um, again, the natural resources identified are primarily on the southern slopes and then the western slopes. Uh, in general, the subject property is uh, highest in the northeast corner uh, and then falls to the southwest here. This is, again, where the flood plain is located. So I'm going to move on to site photos. The site photos start um, on the southwest corner of the site, travel up 500th Avenue, and then east along uh, 170th Street. This is looking northeast from 500th Avenue. Um, this, these are the slopes. With the natural resource areas located on them. Um, down here is the floodplain. This is looking southeast from 500th Avenue toward the southwest quarter quarter. Um, this photo is looking east from 500th Avenue along 170th Street here. Um, looking south from 170th Street along 500th Avenue. And this is looking southwest along 170th Avenue here. Uh, this is the, the property to the west of the subject property. This photo is looking north from 170th Street along 500th Avenue. And then looking northeast from 500th Avenue uh, along 170th Street here. <coughs> this photo is looking southeast from 170th Street at the subject property looking southeast again from 170th Street. This is looking 
directly south of the subject property. Uh, and again, looking south. This is about um, in the middle of the uh, subject property looking south. Again, this is the row crop area looking south from 170th Street. Eastern edge of the property here. This is looking uh, southwest from 170th Street. This is looking southeast from 170th Street at the adjacent farmstead to the east. This is looking northeast uh, at the farmstead to the north. Um, this is looking across 170th Street at the property to the north. And then looking back west from 170th Street uh, toward 500. So getting into the um, standards for approval and the rezoning, uh, the proposed rezoning shall conform to this uh, cornerstone to capstone comprehensive plan. Uh, the C2C plan zoning compatibility matrix shows that the R1 district is compatible with the rural residential designation. And we'll discuss this um, more momentarily. B is that the proposed rezoning shall conform to the statement of intent for the proposed district and district requirements. So the R1 district is intended for single-family dwellings um, with minimum lot sizes of 25,000 square feet. Um, the applicant has requested the R1 district uh, rather than the AR, Agriculture Residential District, to, in order to provide a greater variety of lot sizes, but also to provide smaller lot sizes to better preserve the environmentally sensitive areas on the site. Um, the proposed use of the Southwest Quarter Court is <coughs> the environmentally sensitive areas for open space, recreation area, and stormwater management is more consistent with the Greenville Conservation District than the R1 Residential Transitional District uh, because there's no uh, residential development plan for this area. The applicant has expressed interest in working with Story County Conservation to create a management or ownership agreement uh, for the environmentally sensitive areas rather than leaving this to future residents or um, future homeowners association in order um, to provide what they feel will be the best protection to the environmentally sensitive areas on the site. Um, it should be noted though that uh, if left in agriculture land use under private uh, ownership, it would be difficult to enforce any preservation of the environmentally sensitive areas on the site. Planning and development staff recommend uh, requiring the applicant to request a rezoning of Southwest Quarter Quarter and the environmentally sensitive areas to the Greenbelt Conservation District uh, as part of the subdivision flat submittal, as well as requiring a management and or ownership agreement with Story County Conservation in order to best maintain and preserve the environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, C is the proposed rezoning shall be compatible with surrounding land uses and development patterns. Uh, Eagle Ridge is a major sub uh, I'm sorry. Eagle Ridge is a major residential subdivision located one quarter mile to the south of the subject property. Um, this subdivision is on AR Agricultural Residential. It is one quarter quarter in size and contains 14 lots. Uh, these lots range from 1.1 <coughs> net acres to 1.71 net acres. Eagle Ridge is uh, again located directly on the south side of the floodplain of Squaw Creek. <coughs> um, development is strongly discouraged within the floodplain uh, and therefore we may consider Eagle Ridge as surrounding to the subject property. Planning and development staff recommend a condition limiting the overall density of the proposed rezoning area to no more than 14 lots per quarter quarter.
to further to to increase the density at that time. So standard D references the natural resources on the subject property um, and requires um, conditions for the conservation of natural resources on the site. Uh, based on the survey completed by Dr. Rosberg in October, uh, there are remnant prairie species on the site. However, uh, further inventory must be completed to identify additional natural resources on the site. Uh, planning and development staff recommend this identification as a condition of approval. And once identified, um, these areas should be designated as agricultural conservation area and natural resource area on the C2C future land use map. So the subject property is not an appropriate site for a traditional large lot subdivision. Um, and in order to ensure that the future subdivision plat submittal maintains the uh, existing conservation design principles as submitted by the applicant, um, planning and development staff recommend a condition requiring that any proposed subdivision on the site meet the RC, Residential Conservation Design Overlay District, design and improvement requirements, um, which will limit the environmentally, I'm sorry, which will limit development on the environmentally sensitive areas of the site. Uh, this will ensure conservation principles are maintained without adding additional requirements for landscaping, sidewalks, or other infrastructure improvement requirements um, that are required in the RC uh, Residential Conservation Overlay District. Um, and finally, for the standards of approval for the rezoning request, um, standard E, which is in areas where the petition to rezone the request, um, to rezone requests a change from the A1 Agricultural District to the or the A2 Agribusiness District to another district, uh, land scoring 267 or above for the total leases score as determined by the Land Evaluation Site Assessment as adopted for Story County shall not be approved. So we can see here that three of the four quarter quarters meet the lease of threshold for a rezoning request to be submitted. The Southwest quarter quarter does not meet the threshold for, the rezoning, for a rezoning request to be approved. Uh, the difference in these leases scores is really a result of the varying average site value, which is a, an average of the corn suitability rating of the soil on the site. Uh, because the lease of scores consider surrounding zoning and surrounding land use uh, and the overall score, uh, if the northwest, northeast, and southeast quarter quarters were rezoned to the R1 Transitional Residential District, the lease of score of the southwest quarter quarter would fall below 267 and thus be eligible for a rezoning request. Again, uh, as we discussed before, it is recommended as a condition that the southwest quarter quarter and the environmentally sensitive areas identified on the site are rezoned to the Greenbelt Conservation District. Uh, new dwellings are not permitted in the Greenbelt Conservation District, uh, so this rezoning request would um, permit development in this, these areas. Moving on to the future land use map amendment standards, uh, the first item is that the extent to which the change would be uh, is the extent to which the change would be consistent with the comprehensive plan goals and policies. So there are several um, goals in the C2C plan that are consistent with the proposed amendment. Um, I'm going to this morning focus on um, just a few of the land use goals. Uh, land use goal two. Um, Preserve, protect, and plan around the physical characteristics of the land. Uh, planning the development staff are proposing conditions to identify the environmentally sensitive areas and designate them as natural resources. Uh, land use goal three consider the availability and capacity of local services and infrastructure when determining future land uses. Um, I just want to pull out a few of these items. Uh, there's currently no gas service to this property. However, um, based on discussions with the applicant about the proposed development, Alliant Energy, I'm sorry, Alliant Energy anticipates extending the line west from the city of Gilbert to the subject property. Um, it was communicated by Zinnia Rural Water that the existing system does have capacity to serve a, a residential subdivision at this location. Uh, it does not, however, have the capacity for fire flow or 
residential irrigation systems and less a line is extended uh, from the southeast. Uh, special consideration will need to be taken when designing the drainage of the site. Uh, the subject property is located with, within three drainage district boundaries, um, which need to maintain the drainage uh, within those um, boundaries. <coughs> Standard two looks at whether um, new information has become available since the comprehensive plan was adopted uh, that supports re-examining the plan. Uh, the proposed development offers a new opportunity uh, for the identification and conservation of the environmentally sensitive areas on the site. The C2C plan includes a proposed trails and greenway map, uh, which, which includes a proposed hard surface trail along 500th Avenue uh, and 170th Street adjacent to the subject property. Now, the planning um, of the subject property is a good time to allocate space for a future potential uh, hard surface trail. County Conservation staff recommended condition of a 20 foot wide easement along the west and north sides of the property to allow for the potential future development of a hard surface trail. <clears throat> Standard three, uh, whether or not the change is needed to allow reasonable, reasonable development of the site, um, a rural residential designation is necessary for a residential uh, <coughs> development on the site. The proposed conditions of the amendment will, will more clearly um, locate and identify the natural resource areas on the site uh, and provide an opportunity for the preservation and uh, maintenance of these areas. I'm sorry. Uh, standard four is the relationship of the proposed amendment to the supply and demand for the particular land uses within the county and immediate vicinity. Uh, there is a demand for rural residential dwellings in Story County. With a growing population, additional housing will be needed, and the proposed development will provide another um, type of housing option, uh, smaller lots and an open recreation area. Uh, the proposed conditions will assist in preserving the environmentally sensitive areas on the site. And in order to ensure gradual uh, land use transitions to uh, reduce potential incompatibilities with uh, agricultural use, um, staff recommends a minimum of a 50 foot buffer along the east side of the proposed development. Five is a demonstration that the proposed amendment has merit beyond the interests of the applicant. Um, the proposed amendment uh, obviously serves the interests of the applicant by allowing residential lots to be platted and sold for single family dwelling development. Uh, additionally, current and future residents of Story County will benefit from the preserved and maintained environmentally sensitive areas on the site, as well as the preserved open space. The preservation will also provide an open space buffer from the surrounding um, land uses, provide space for improved stormwater management and erosion control, and foster habitat for the growth of the existing remnant prairie species. <coughs> Lastly, the proposed development may act as a resource um, for future developments uh, that are going to use uh, conservation design principles. Six looks at the possible impacts of the amendment on all specific elements of the comprehensive plan. Um, again, for the conservation of the natural resources and the recreation area, uh, the proposed development provides an increased opportunity for recreation in Story County. An inventory of the site will provide a more accurate representation of the natural resources on the site. Uh, in terms of transportation, the applicant will be required to submit a traffic impact analysis as part of the major subdivision application. Uh, further, again, staff is recommending that 20-foot easement along the west and north edges of the proposed subdivision um, when that application is submitted for the potential future development of a hard surface trail. And lastly, standard seven um, is consideration of the fiscal impacts of the proposed amendment to Story County. Uh, any fiscal, any potential fiscal impacts will be determined at the time of the submittal of the major subdivision plan. Um, we did hold a conceptual review meeting on October 11th of this year. Uh, 
Um, I'm just going to highlight a few of those comments. Um, conservation did uh, note the 22 species of native prairies, um, I'm sorry, 22 native prairie species located on the site, um, but that they continue, uh, will continue to gather information um, and I look forward to working with the applicant to explore the potential of environmentally sensitive development on this site. The Story County engineer noted a 500 foot site distance requirement we have in our code um, in order to keep drainage within the drainage district boundaries um, and avoid disturbing the tile. Um, it was anticipated that this will add approximately 700 vehicle trips per day to 170th Street. Um, but the traffic impacts and access locations will be addressed when the subdivision plat is submitted. Um, the new traffic impact analysis and study ordinance will be in effect. Story County Environmental Health um, had discussions with the applicant about a potential centralized system um, and what the um, benefits and, and negatives were for the developer and the homeowners. Um, we sent notice letters to uh, property owners within a quarter mile of the proposed rezoning um, and to the city of Gilbert on November 27th um, in regards to the planning zoning commission meeting and this meeting today. Um, the notice was also published in the three papers designated by the Board of Supervisors on November 27th. Um, so, we received some public comments prior to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. We received um, a few phone calls and an email just asking for additional information on the rezoning request. Um, a Planning and Zoning Commission member was contacted by the Mayor Gilbert to discuss the proposed project. Uh, that same commission member forwarded comments and questions from an adjacent property owner. Um, these included questions about the drainage district boundaries, the drainage tile preservation, um, and the natural flow of water on the site. <coughs> um, this individual had questions about whether or not the Greenbelt Conservation District was applicable to the site, or um, if the RC design, um, residential conservation design overlay district was applicable. Um, this individual did state that they believe the further studies of the environmentally sensitive areas should be completed. Um, and then just ask the general question of, is placing 80 houses on such a small area consistent with um, the rural residential area principles, uh, specifically principle one, which is to ensure that new development is sensitive to the predominantly <coughs> rural nature of the areas. So the comments from the public at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting um, included that I was ranked the lowest out of 50 states for the amount of natural landscaping remaining, um, just providing reason to preserve what we have. Uh, the conflicts between identifying environmentally sensitive areas of the proposed concept plan um, were noted. Um, this individual felt that there were some conflicts between where the environmentally sensitive areas were located and the proposed concept plan. Um, potential, this, this individual also um, thought that the potential story county conservation management of the environmentally sensitive areas would be a positive thing. Um, the residential subdivision um, de developments have had significant impacts on natural landscapes and other areas. Um, there's concern about how the LISA scores are evaluated and if Story County is really trying to preserve agricultural land through these scores. Um, there's a question about will the natural flow of water on the site be maintained? How does the applicant propose to buffer the impacts of the residential <coughs> development from the existing livestock and crops in the area? Uh, we talked about buffering the uh, proposed residential development from the livestock and crops and this uh, individual turned the question around. Um, Lisa scores do, um, another individual <coughs> indicated that the Lisa scores do not represent the productivity of the ground. Um, there are concerns about an emergency response. response accessing the um, proposed lots, particularly in the southeast quarter quarter uh, during large rain events due to the topography of the site. Um, there are concerns about impact on existing cattle operations, uh, specifically the one to the east. Um, it was noted that 170th Street is a farm-to-market road, um, so 
there's a lot of agricultural equipment traffic. Um, this individual uh, also indicated that there is land closer to Ames that has not yet been developed, as well as lots available in the Buck Hill Estate subdivision to the north. Uh, Gilbert recently annexed land for residential development. Uh, there will be additional cost to the Gilbert Fire Department uh, to serve the area. Um, and the water will have to be supplied by the city of Gilbert um, because Xenia indicated that they don't have capacity for fire flow. Um, there are also concerns regarding the increase in traffic through the city of Gilbert, um, and it was noted that this would be an increase in the tax base for the uh, Gilbert Community School District. Here's some comments from the Planning and Zoning Commission. It was noted that the remnant prairie species on the area, there were remnant prairie species on the area recommended for the rezoning. Um, there's a question about what is the impact of the easements and buffers proposed uh, as conditions on the developable area of the property? Um, how will the three day drainage districts impact the, the development? Uh, residential development can have negative impact on the adjacent and nearby livestock. Uh, it may be necessary to construct a fence around the entire property to minimize these impacts. Uh, is Eagle Ridge really surrounding the subject property? Uh, it's a quarter mile from the very southwest corner of the property. Uh, why is the southwest quarter quarter included in the rezoning request? Uh, since the three quarter quarters are planned for development, why did staff consider all four quarter quarters and the maximum overall density this is 42 versus 56 lots. And why does the existing ordinance limit the rezoning um, from, from an A1 or A2 district with a lease of square greater than 267? We do have zoning district that's more restrictive than these. Um, so that question was asked. Um, and then why was the RC overlay district not used for, for the proposed subdivision? Should the RC overlay district be amended? Um, and then it was also asked if there's a maximum lot size in the Arvin district. Other public comments. Um, on Monday, December 10th, we did receive an email from an adjacent property owner with several questions related to the lease evaluation and also the meaning of rural versus urban residential density. Uh, staff did respond to these questions via email. So our points to consider. There are negative, I'm sorry, there are native prairie remnants and other natural resources on the site. Uh, the C2C plan discourages development in these areas and proposes the Greenbelt Conservation District as an appropriate zoning district for conserving the natural areas. A management and or ownership agreement with Story County Conservation would be more effective in preserving um, the native prairie remnants and other environmentally sensitive areas on the site then placing sole responsibility on future residents or homeowners association. The development, uh, per sorry. Uh, the proposed development is adjacent to two paved county roads. Uh, since the development is just, since development is discouraged within the floodplain, it can be determined that the subject property is surrounding um, to the existing development at Eagle Ridge. Allowing an overall density of 14 dwellings per quarter quarter is consistent with the development at Eagle Ridge and the surrounding land use in the area. The R1 district will allow for smaller lot sizes, offering greater protection to the environmentally sensitive areas and open space on the property. Um, a traffic impact analysis will be required with the subdivision plat application. Road or traffic improvements will be considered at that time. The C2C comprehensive plan includes a proposed trails and greenway map, which includes um, a hard surface trail along <coughs> Avenue and 170th Street, the western and northern boundaries of the subject property. Um, so, planning and development staff made the following recommendation to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, planning and development staff support the proposed rezoning from the A1 Agricultural District to the R1 Transitional Residential District and the C2C Future Land Use Map designation from the Agricultural Conservation Area and Natural Research Area to the Rural Residential Area for the Northwest Quarter 
the southwest quarter, I'm sorry, the northwest quarter, the northeast quarter, and the southwest quarter of the subject property um, with the following conditions. The overall density of the future subdivision shall be consistent with the density of the Eagle Ridge subdivision located to the south. Uh, and that means not to exceed 14 development lots per quarter quarter in order to match the existing character of the area. Condition two is that the applicant shall collaborate with Story County Conservation to identify and map the locations of the environmentally sensitive areas, including the southwest of the northwest quarter quarter on the subject property, um, including but not those uh, limited, including but not limited to those uh, areas identified in condition seven below. Condition three, uh, the applicant shall request a future land use map designation amendment for the environmentally sensitive areas identified in condition two uh, from the requested rural residential designation to the agricultural conservation designation at the time of the proposed subdivision plat uh, and rezoning submittal. Uh, the environmentally sensitive areas identified in condition two shall further be designated as natural resource area on the C2C future land use map. Condition four um, is in order to ensure the long-term protection of the environmentally sensitive areas and the floodplain areas, uh, an application to rezone the southwest quarter quarter um, and all environmentally sensitive areas identified uh, through the inventory and condition two um, shall be submitted for the A1 Agricultural District and the R1 Transitional Residential District uh, to the Greenbelt Conservation District. Um, a management and our ownership agreement with Story County Conservation shall be made and submitted at the time of the rezoning um, in order to best preserve the um, preserve and maintain the identified environmentally sensitive areas on the site. Condition five uh, it is in accordance with principle four of the rural residential area C2C uh, future land use map designation a buffer of no no less than 50 feet shall be maintained between the proposed subdivision development lots and the agricultural land use located to the east. Condition six, um, a 20 foot wide easement for a future hard surface trail shall be provided on the north and west sides of the proposed subdivision for future trail development uh, as described in the C2C plan. And finally, condition seven, uh, as a part of the subdivision plat submittal, the development improvements shall meet the requirements um, of the Residential Conservation Zone <coughs> Overlay District um, design and improvement requirements. Um, this is um, uh, limiting um, development on areas such as wetlands, native prairie remnants, um, places with significant tree cover, uh, and areas having um, slopes greater than 14%. Areas that provide uh, habitat for rare, <coughs> threatened, or endangered species, burial sites, and Native American mounds, and then drainage waves um, containing running water during spring runoff or during storm events. So, at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on December 5th, um, following discussion, there was a motion uh, that was made to recommend approval of planning staff's recommended, recommended conditions. Uh, removing condition one, which is the maximum density condition, um, to the Story County Board of Supervisors. Uh, this motion failed for a lack of a second. Another motion was made to recommend approval of the staff recommendation, um, which included all of the conditions to the Board of Supervisors as uh, provided above. Which and we'll get to in a second. Alternative number five. Um, the vote on this motion was two to three. Um, we do need a majority vote of those present, which would be three of five, um, to recommend approval or denial of the motion. There were no additional motions made by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So here are your alternatives today. Um, you may recommend uh, approval as submitted by the applicant, um, approval as submitted by the applicant with conditions, uh, denial of the proposal by the applicant. Um, you could uh, choose to remand the request um, back to staff and the um, 
applicant for further discussions and bring it back to you on a different date. Um, or the fifth uh, alternative would be number five, which is what planning and development staff recommend, um, which is approval of the rezoning of the um, northwest quarter quarter, the northeast quarter quarter, and the southeast quarter quarter, um, as well as the future land use map amendment for those areas um, with the conditions listed above with rule one through seven. Very thorough. Yeah, very thorough. Thank you. Um, yeah, so questions from the board. I've got just a couple. So all we're talking about today is the rezoning of this property. That does not imply approval of a plat or anything like that. Is that right? That's correct. Second one is, and Jerry, maybe you helped me with this one. I have never heard of us establishing density based on a quarter quarter before. Have we ever done that before? Well, and again, that comes from one of the criteria of the zoning ordinance, which talks about if you're going to request a change in zoning, you need to establish the, what the existing land use is and the development pattern. So that's why we drew from the Eagle Ridge development, which is the closest development. Sure, but I also and heard that the Eagle Ridge development ranges in lot sizes of 1.1 acres to 1.7 acres. So in my mind, I'm just kind of calling it one developable lot kind of per acre of the, of the development, and I'm wondering if there wasn't another way to get there, because we've got this range, right, from 81 from the proposal from the developer to 56 based on 14 lots per quarter quarter, and I'm just trying to understand how all that works when I also heard you say that smaller lot sizes in it with rural character would have some appeal and is something that, that we need in our inventory so, so I'm, it's not congruent for me if I'm hearing smaller lot sizes, but also fewer lots. Those two don't don't line up very well, right? Well, in the smaller lots, the R1 uh, zoning district request, which is the 25,000 square foot. Oh, no, which a half acre, right? Roughly it, a half acre. It's nice in this particular case because it helps preserve those environmentally sensitive areas. And the applicant has no intention of developing those areas. So, that's why it, it makes that request um, something uh, worth supporting. Sure. Thank you. Other questions, board? Talk to me about fire service concerns. We're trying to move a development here in Nevada. One of the things we're having trouble with uh, Central Idaho raw water is uh, being both a contributor on a raw water basis and uh, meeting fire service codes. What's the story there? Because you are clearly out in the county. Yeah, so the Gilbert um, Fire Department does have trucks um, to serve the rural areas where they cannot um, connect to uh, fire water, uh, fire hydrants. Um, so this is something they're already doing. Um, they wouldn't have any hydrants to connect to anyway in this area. So the fact that there's um, not enough pressure for fire service scoring as on the movement to an R1 designation I get that if you do the three quarter quarters and that pulls down the, the conservation green belt designation is don't we have the ability to lock this in as being something that we have control on in the sense that the conservation is there because of an agreement as it's proposed Are you asking that does it have to be uh, formally rezoned at some point, that green belt part? The concern or just was expressed at the con at, uh, planning zoning in the sense that because of the R moving the A1 to the R1, that would pull down the uh, lease score of the floodplain area and whatnot. And does that not get uh, moved to the side by having the uh, green belt designation, the conservation green belt designation? So, um, in the code, um, it says that when there's a lease score higher than 267, the property um, is zoning from the A1 or A2 district to any other district shall not be approved. Um, so, we don't have the, we can't rezone um, a property with a high lease score at all to any other district. Um, but if we do it after, as we talk about if the surrounding land use has changed, um, that will impact the lease score. Um, and 
and that will bring it below 267. And then we bring it in. And then we can, um, someone can submit an application for rezoning at that time. To so rebuild conservation, which helps protect those areas and allows them to do projects with regard to some more based upon how the vision of our own planning and our zoning residential districts are going into the ag in going from, you point out like Eagle Ridge is only 14 lots for the quarter and then all of a sudden we would be going to a much higher density and in that leapfrog would not a consequence be that uh, somebody else would sell 160 acres of farmland right next door, say maybe, and another developer comes in and wants to go to that density, and then staff comes to us back and says, oh look, but right next door, we've got a higher density. So isn't that kind of what leapfrogging is when you start jumping over the natural progression of higher and higher, or lower and lower densities the further you get out? so that all of a sudden you've got a band of much higher density? Yeah, the way that we were able to come to the conclusion that the subject property was surrounding the development in Eagle Ridge was, as Emily mentioned, much of this area south, and including the southwest quarter of this property, is in the floodplain. And so that acts as somewhat of a corridor by which development is not supported or encouraged. Um, there is another quarter quarter to the south with a single family dwelling on that, on that 40 acres, but much of that parcel is in the floodplain. So just south of that corridor, the floodplain is the area. So that's how we're able to draw that conclusion that it is surrounding. So the, uh, Ricky and Stead were only considering the rezoning today. But it's my understanding from some of the discussions that have occurred with the developer, the staff, um, uh, the developer uh, that approached me with some contact, okay, that um, if, there, if there would be a possibility of approving the rezoning but then not approving later on a preliminary plat down the road, that that may not be advantageous for the developer due to the purchase price, et cetera. Well, I think, it, I think that's completely fair, of course, that uh, any, any developer would need to know generally how many lots, not necessarily the configuration of those lots, but how many lots would be a, a, approved as part of the purchase price because this ground's worth a different amount if you can build 50 houses than if you can build 80 houses. Correct. Yeah. And I, I think if we, the owners here, right? Yes. We're going to hear from you. Yeah, yeah okay, great. Then I'll let you have a question. Any other questions for Jerry or Emily before we move on to the uh, applicant and the owner of the property, and then we'll open the public hearing. Not at this time. Good. Okay. Good job. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, thanks. At this point, let's hear from Mr. Friedrich and Mr. Dotson, um, and I'm just going to turn it over to you guys to talk to us about what you want to talk to us about, and then I'm sure we'll have questions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Robert Dotson. I'm the uh, trustee of the Dotson Family Trust A. That's uh, in that capacity, and I hope he's entitled to this property. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, I want to just a few minutes of the board's time uh, to give you some uh, awareness as to what has prompted our application for this change in zoning at this time. I'll try to be very brief, but I think the history will be of value to the board itself. Uh, this property was first acquired by my father back in 1960 as a part of a larger track. Uh, as other pieces were sold off uh, decades ago, he retained title of this uh, because uh, of his view that the property was suitable for uh, a very nice development residential development, and that at some time in the future, uh, that would be the highest and best use to which this property could be put. Uh, the other property was mostly grow crop and was sold for that. Uh, 
he passed in 2003, and uh, I assume title as trustee of his trust. The initial beneficiary was my mother, uh, who passed away uh, about four years later. Uh, the primary beneficiary now is uh, my elder sister, uh, uh, who started developing health issues, and that prompted uh, my work to position this property to make it more suitable for uh, residential development. I gathered information back in 2016 about the various uh, conservation reserve programs, and in 2017, put in a bid to enroll uh, what you've been describing as the Southwest Quarter Quarter, as well as a small tract in the Northwest Quarter in the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, uh, the one that I selected is what's called the Pollinator Program. Uh, it's more expensive, but uh, it yields uh, when successful, at least in my experience, uh, a remarkably attractive uh, transitional prairie to what I already consider to be uh, a property <coughs> for the Valley. Folks never had the opportunity of knowing my father. Uh, he was a blue collar guy. He came to Ames in the 30s as a bread truck driver. I grew up in a gas station. Uh, he always pitched for the little guy. When he dealt in real estate, one of the things that that always his mind, and therefore, in the back of mind, this was who is going to buy these lots? You've already had several questions about lot size, but you haven't touched on and that is uh, the allocation of the fixed costs of development over the lots. These lots we hope are to be sold to families with school-aged children. To do that, anticipating the fixed cost of bringing this development in, if you do 80 lots, you want to stretch a little bit, 70 to 80. Then your price point is within the reach of a family with school-aged children. If you cut it back into the 50, larger lots, many of those people will drop out of the market. Uh, you'll be selling these lots to more mature couples, presumably with children beyond school age. That's not what we want. Think about where this is, what are the two miles from the school? We want those kids to go to school and build it. It's not part of the fixed you're charging for them. Absolutely. Just want to make that sure, clear to there. Land for less. You, you could sell land for less too, but, and that's not our business. I just want to point no, that out. No, but it's a great segue to the next point <coughs> that I needed to make uh, for this group. In my opening comments, I talked about the time. Uh, in the intervening years, and specifically starting on July 13th, sister uh, was removed from the home she occupied in all line at her hometown for over four years and uh, moved to a care facility in the area. This trust provides uh, the money to keep her in that community. The cost of supporting her in uh, her former residence uh, was less than a third of the cost of every to do something with this property. Uh, I really have two choices. Either we develop it, go for the goal that uh, my father had back in the 1960s, or I have to find a way to make that agriculture. 
comfortable land under day one more productive. I suspect that most of the folks here are, are here for the second item on the agenda. It's kind of a no-brainer if I can't develop it. If Mr. Friedrich and his group say, no, that's just not enough lots, this isn't going to work, then I have a choice of one, and that's to explore enhancing the agricultural use. There's a one-word answer to that livestock, whether it's hogs, cattle, or poultry. You don't know, have a whole lot of choices. I would really prefer to bring in the development. I don't know if any of you have gone out and looked at this. Did you walk out in the pasture up to the top of the hill? I would not do that, but that's a mobility issue for the Vice President. All right. Well, well yeah. the first government did. What a wonderful place to build a house. The proposal that Mr. Kendrick and his group put together is the right price point. Mr. Johnson, thank you very much. Right. Kurt? Well said, Bob, thank you. My name is Kurt Friedrich with Friedrich Real Estate. We're pleased to bring this uh, proposal forward today. I want to thank also Emily and Jerry for the diligence in their reporting. Uh, they've spent a great deal of time uh, with us exploring uh, the viability of residential development at, the, at this location and the potential challenges. And I can say that there's clearly been a paradigm shift in the thinking um, as we've gone through the due diligence process. Uh, we've engaged several members of staff. Uh, Mike Cox and Dr. Tom Rosberg were mentioned earlier. Uh, we together went out to the property and surveyed the property and they took an, a natural resources inventory of the property to help us arrive at the design that we are proposing today. As it's been stated, uh, today is really just about a comprehensive plan for change and a rezoning. It is not about the preliminary plot, but in view of the importance to us of lot count and layout, it was critical that we bring forward sooner than we normally would a concept plan so that you all would not be surprised when, when we do come forward with a preliminary plan of what we might be uh, desiring to see happen here. The plan before you does represent 80 lots and we're excited to bring this forward. We're just finishing up Cameron Estates in the county, which is another conservation subdivision. We've, we've been a part of more conservation subdivisions than any other developer in our area. It's been very successful, and we only have 10 lots remaining in Cameron Estates. So we know the need is there, and we need to provide a new, a new neighborhood for people to move who want to live in the county was said at the Planning and Zoning Commission that it would be desirable for everyone to live in the city. 
and that's just not reality. Uh, we need to provide different kinds of housing solutions for families based on their wants and their needs. There certainly are advantages to living in a city in terms of logistics and location to services, schools, shopping, etc. But there are advantages, as, as you know, to living in the county as well. Advantages like quiet and, uh, and nice open spaces and room uh, to, to move out and, and build something that is a little different than what you could in the city. In fact, in Ames, we are restricted uh, with our zoning code to building approximately 3.75 housing units per acre, which equates to a 10,000 square foot lot. What we are proposing here under the R1 zoning is something that's two and a half times what could be achieved in the city of Ames. And that's certainly something that people desire is a little more room. And uh, just an important, important distinction there between what we are offering and further with the density that we are, are asking for, 80 lots, and frankly, 80 lots over 160 acres is extremely low density overall. And that's how we look at the project, is a 160 acre project. But what we're trying to do, and Bob had, had alluded to this, is not deliver another subdivision of large lots that are priced out of reach for the majority of, home, of households. We are trying to create a subdivision that is within reach of the majority of households who are looking to move up in Story County to new housing and provide a more attractive price point. Uh, Eagle Ridge has been mentioned. Eagle Ridge, uh, the average lot price is between $150,000 to $200,000. Uh, we, it's a great subdivision, but again, it's, it's out of reach for most, and it's completely built out. And the average home price for the assessors is $850,000 in Eagle Ridge. While I imagine we will have some homes that may approach that number, uh, the majority of homes will, we are not seeking to duplicate that. We want something, again, that is more in reach of the majority of households. An important distinction. The second critical piece of this development, besides providing important housing, which by the way, will, will provide uh, an unlocking of existing inventory of homes, a really important progression that will open up some entry level housing for people in Story County. Second critical piece is conservation. And most of you have driven by the property and Bob talked about highest and best use. What is the highest and best use for this property? It is rolling, it has steep slopes, and yes, we have discovered uh, with the, the help of Mike and Tom Rosberg um, some prairie remnant, and there are drainage ways that are eroding. And quite frankly, uh, it is my belief, and I hope that you will conclude the same thing, is that through a well laid out development like we are proposing, you can provide much needed housing and you can better protect the environment through conservation by setting aside the lands, which is what we would be doing. We will be setting aside of the 160 acres, approximately 90 acres. 56% of this property will be set aside in perpetuity for the purpose of conservation. In the city of Ames, we've done the first, the first conservation subdivision under the city's new conservation subdivision ordinance. The main proponent of the conservation subdivision in Ames is that you must set aside 25% of the land in outlots or conservation use. We're more than double that with this proposal. And, and finally, um, we've had some um, side conversations uh, with, with others about concern over wastewater. And, and I'll conclude my comments and then 
and then we'll make ourselves available for question. But in these areas, we have we have looked at and designed around the areas that Dr. Rosberg and Mike have identified as desirable for preservation, restoration, and, and that's what you see here reflected. Um, there is, I think, maybe a heightened level of concern over the, the lots that are located in the northwest quarter quarter. And, and based on my discussions, I, I think we, f we feel that we would be willing to sacrifice some of the home sites in that area, peel it back a little so that we're a little further away from some of those identified uh, prairie remnants. And further, uh, related to wastewater, we would be capable of, in, in, uh, in areas uh, where there are grouping of lots of, say, four to six lots, uh, we could uh, with still have individualized wastewater systems, but a common collection line that would then take that affluent to a distribution field, a single distribution field further away from these areas. And as I understand it, and I'm not a prairie expert, uh, Mike is, is more versed on this, and I know Dr. Rosberg more versed than all of us, but I know that it is desirable to keep the, the land where the prairie remnant is located in a drier state, not to saturate it, that that is counter to the restorative ability of the prairie. And in view of that, we would be open to uh, utilizing combined systems, if you will, uh, and certainly can do that and create a, a drainage field to release the water, which by the way, with the use of our Advantech systems that we are advocating for the lots, the affluent is, is pure when it comes out of the Advantech system. And then we will just be distributing the water through the distribution lines, but we need to get it to a single point, and we can do that. And I think achieve the goals that we have, which are housing and conservation. And by the way, we're planning a lot of trails throughout the development for the enjoyment and recreation of our residents and the folks in Story County. So we think it's a great <coughs> um, In closing, um, would agree with the, uh, with the recommendation of staff, um, with the exception of the 56 lot count. I really would like to know, I need to know, an approximate lot count of what you could support to allow us to know whether or not this is an economically viable project to move forward. So thank you very much. And th thank you, Kurt, Mr. Dodson. So, um, so you indicated that there in the in the northwest corner, maybe there's a little room to work. Yes. Uh, so, so I'm hearing maybe it's not 81 lots. The second thing I heard was um, that you're talking about the total developable ground in the 70 acre range, not the. If you're a half acre, you're not developing all of that 70 acres, but it's 70 acres that, that you'd like to work on developing. Yes. And so I'm just wondering, um, as you look for a number, it, is it reasonable to look at, again, I go back to Eagle Ridge and even across the street in Boone County, and the average is just over an acre right. per home site. Is it possible to say there's 70 developable acres there, so no more than 70 uh, one one per developable acre lot is that a workable number to you to make it feasible? Um, it's not ideal, but um, it it certainly gets us closer to where we would need to be, and and I would say we we would be viable at that point. Uh, Mike Cox and I did did visit a little bit about this uh, potential reduction. In, in lots in that northwest quarter quarter and and, and maybe Mike can, can speak to this too but um, he had he had mentioned that potentially uh, that in view of eliminating lots in that northwest quarter quarter 
essentially those two cul-de-sacs would be pulled back and or eliminated. Um, and then providing uh, a different way of treating wastewater, like we, we discussed. But that in the southwest, or excuse me, southeast uh, quarter quarter, that there really there is less desirable, if you will, prairie located in that area, and that potentially uh, some some lots could be added back in at that location. Uh, further, I will say just. We did a lot of research um, leading up to today. We talked with Gilbert Fire, we talked with the trustees, we talked with the, the school members of the school board with Gilbert. No, really no red flags. And also spoke with, tried to reach out to neighbors uh, as much as possible. And obviously we don't see eye to eye with everyone, but we're just trying to be a good neighbor and do our, our, our typical outreach. Um, there were some folks to the south of us uh, that, that sit on a 45 acre lot that is basically landlocked. And so we are we are looking at already eliminating, I think it's lot 80, shown on the plat at the south end, and providing an access point uh, to continue uh, the road to the south to pick up and provide a nice paved access for our neighbors to the south. Um, additionally, uh, to, the, to the north, um, and I can't make out the, my eyes have failed me here, <laughs> but uh, towards the north end of the project, and I think, is that lot 25? It's sort of a, a trapezoidal um, lot there at the corner, <laughs> see southeast southeast corner of the intersection of those two roads in the northwest quarter quarter. That lot also I think we will eliminate and provide just a small neighborhood park for the benefit of our <coughs> Thank you. Questions for Kurt or Mr. Dodson? I've listened to a lot of presentations, but I want to tell you this, the timeliness of this discussion could not have been better for the, the audience that we have here. You were plainly spoken and it was very informative and easy to follow. Mr. Dodson, you have my sympathies in regards to the family dynamic you have playing out in front of you. I have two questions for you. Had your sister's circumstances not been what they were, would this property even be available for development? Probably not. And my second question is, so as I plainly have heard it, and I suspect the choices are stark, it is either homes or a cave home. Thank you. We would certainly consider that, Laura. So uh, what we're looking at doing is not, and I don't think that this would be good uh, from a fiduciary standpoint for us to, or frankly for the county, to turn over all 90 acres. I don't think that would, that would not be a feasible thing for, uh, for the county, frankly. Uh, what we typically do and have done, for example, at, at Quarry States in Ames is the majority of the green spaces that we are establishing that will be established as outlots, and again, in perpetuity, they will be outlots. They will not be buildable outlots, but outlots that are set aside in these strategic locations where there are waterways and there are existing prairie plant remnant that we want to preserve. Um, some of those outlots, Actually, the majority of the outlots that are adjacent to the residential areas, uh, primarily in the southeast and northeast, and then toward the north half of the northwest quarter quarter, those will be those will be under the care and ownership, likely of the HOA, and um, paid through association dues um, into that HOA to to provide a mechanism, management, and maintenance um, system for those outlots. The area to the south and west is an area that potentially we could see, um, if if we're all in agreement, uh, potentially see deeding that 
over to the county as a dedicated conservation area. It could serve even as a park for the county. And I'm sorry that light has, has put your family. Okay, other questions before we open the public hearing? None. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. So at this time, um, I will ask John Johnson, uh, who has indicated interest in addressing us today, to come to the microphone. Sure. Absolutely. Mr. Johnson, start by introducing yourself and your address, please. Certainly. Uh, my name is John Johnson. Uh, my my current my personal address is 3707 Bridgeport Drive, which is in Little Bridge Heights edition. Uh, but my brother and I own the family farm directly across from this property. And my brother lives on that residence. Uh, we were born and raised there. Um, my father, my grandfather, and my great grandfather lived there. The so that's the perspective I'm coming from today. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a few minutes to just discuss some items that came up in the planning and development report and uh, then refer maybe to some of the major aspects of the C2C plan and how they may be applicable in this situation. Uh, so the first item I'd like to discuss would be the leases scores. And as it's already been stated, uh, and it's ordinance number 208, that uh, any land with a lease score greater than 267 is not open for rezoning. Uh, then I would look at the agricultural conservative area principles that are stated in the C2C plan. And the overarching number one principle is to conserve agricultural land as well as agricultural practices is the fundamental principle of Stone County. And it would be my hope that you keep that principle in mind as we discuss this. Uh, Planning and Development Report has already outlined the lease of scores uh, as three of the four quarter quarters being below the 267 threshold. Uh, I did contact Mr. Moore to ask if I could have the manner or the algorithm by which lease of scores are calculated, and I was told there is no algorithm, and I received no information as far as how these scores are derived. So I feel as though that's still something I don't understand well. Uh, I also asked if a third party could conduct an elisa evaluation on this property. Then I was told no. Uh, then I asked, are the computations strictly objective? And he said, there is, his response was, there is a little subjective input. Uh, I'd like to specifically look at the northeast quarter quarter then, and as noted, the lease score there is 266. So looking at that number, that's less than a third of 1% less than the 267 required to keep the threshold. When you consider our maximum score of 300 is what is obtainable. Um, since there's some subjective input into this lease of evaluation, I guess I, I would think a 266 score is controversial at least. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I realize there have to be rules set on how these, how these activities are conducted or how the computations are made. But I guess um, the other night at the Planning and Development, or the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, Mr. Krieger made the comment that this is union property. That's one thing we can totally agree on. It is union property. I will not argue that point. But I do think that there is some merit to consider developing lease of scores for the land based on the current land use. So if we were to look at, say, just the row crop ground in the north east quarter quarter, the south, excuse me, <laughs> I have to I do the mental gyrations to make sure I'm saying the right thing here. The southeast quarter quarter, I'm fairly confident that those lease of scores on the ground intended for real crop production would be greater than 267. Um, I guess another question I would have is we're looking at 66 acres of 
blazing way that has virtually no tree cover. It's capable of supporting a cow for every two acres. And that stocking density would be unprecedented in our area for any timber pasture. It's the stocking density in those type of pasture situations would be more like five acres. So if you're, you're not talking about unproductive ground. May, the ground may not be suited for row crop production, but we're not looking at ground that is unproductive for livestock production. And since the overarching principle does say conserving, uh, excuse me, I refer back to it to make sure I state that right, agricultural practices, I think that's, that opens the window to not just row crop and not just CSR, but for animal livestock. Which is what I think we heard Mr. Dotson say, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I agree. Uh, and could I ask just a question? Sure. Okay, so you were saying it would be like five cattle per acre? On, if you're going to look at a comparable timber pasture, it would be five acres per cow. Okay, so but you're talking about the confined um, animal feeding operation. And to me, I, I, I'm getting the impression you're talking about grazing. Well, that's what's currently, I'm talking about the current land use, and that's what it is, is grazing. And what I'm trying to tell you, uh, Ms. Olson, is that this is a highly productive grazing ground. It's capable of supporting one cow for every two acres. And so I, I'm, I'm saying comparable. We're not looking at apples to apples, is what I'm trying to say. As far as grazing ground, this is highly productive grazing ground. Thank you. Uh, So, I, I, again, I would say that maybe in, in, since we all agree this is a unique topic, maybe a unique way of evaluating the ground based on this is first possible to find. Uh, next point I'd like to look at is the analysis of the standards for approval from the planning and development staff report. Mr. Johnson, before we leave the lease at issue, can I ask Jerry to tell us who was all involved in storing the lease score in his office? Just walk us through, please. 101. Yeah, 101. 100. Well, with regard to the number, anytime we, first of all, the planning staff does the review, there's, there's like 11 questions that we answer. Um, what, the, what is the average site value? What's the percent of area in agricultural within one mile of a site? Uh, land and agriculture adjacent to the site, what's the adjacent zoning, agricultural support systems and services, what's the land use compatibility for the area, the distance to urban built up areas, compatibility of site for agricultural use, distance to a municipal water system, distance to sanitary sewer system, again within a, a city or an incorporated area, and then the availability of municipal public transit. With regard to numbering, anytime Administratively, anytime we have a number that's close to 267, it's, we always have another planner do it and they don't talk about what number right. is generated. And so in this case, they, they both re obtain the same number. Okay, thank you. Thank you. May I ask something? Sure. Um, in, in the case of this. Get, get to the microphone so that we've got it. In the case of the Northeast Quarter Quarter, the only um, points that were deducted from the score uh, had to do with the proximity to the city of Gilbert. Because it is within two miles, uh, there was one uh, point uh, removed for that. Um, the, the, the reason and, and what staff doesn't have control of is um, what has been uh, designated as the average site value. And that's what brings up below 266. Um, so in terms of subjectivity on this particular one, Okay, thank you, thank you. Marty, that answer for you? Yes, it gets me there. Okay. Good, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Uh, I'd like to move on to the analysis of the zoning standards and specifically to look at uh, C, uh, the proposed rezoning shall be compatible with surrounding land uses and development patterns. And we've already heard the narrative that they said this is going to be similar to uh, Eagle Ridge, uh, 14 houses before the border. And we also heard that it would be similar to Buck Hills uh, in the Boone County. 
Uh, after initially reading this report and hearing this, I thought, well, we're only going to be looking at rezoning three quarter quarters here. So therefore, my assumption was then three quarter quarters would mean that we would be looking at 42 lots. Uh, so at the meeting the other night, I kept hearing this number 56 come up. And so I did raise the question, uh, you know, the math I took said three times 14 is 42. How do you come up with this number? And I was told that all four quarter quarters needed to be considered. So as I, I consider that, uh, let me suggest for the sake of argument, let's do the same type of fuzzy math with the southwest quarter of section, or of section seven of Franklin Township. The, sec the quarter that would include Eagle Ridge. So if we can consider all four quarter quarters of that, there would be a total of 16 houses in that quarter quarter. And then I divide 16 by four, I come up with four as the housing density. So I think it's all a matter of semantics, but I think we're stretching it here a little bit in saying that this density is exactly the same as Eagle Ridge. And it's not even comparable to Buck Hills. I mean, at the end of my presentation, you will see a couple of pictures that show a Google Earth view of Buck Hills versus if you could transpose this map upon this section seven of Franklin Township, I think it would be, uh, it would look incredibly dense compared to any of the divisions that are going on in our area currently. I guess the other thing that I would mention, and I know you're already well aware of this, that Eagle Ridge was designated an agricultural residential reason. And uh, this is contrary to what uh, Mr. Friedrich has requested uh, R1 transitional residential. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is that going back to land use, when we considered when Eagle Ridge was approved or rezoned to agricultural residential, that was an abandoned timber pasture. We're not looking at an abandoned timber pasture here. We're looking, if you remember the pictures, of cows and calves grazing on this current grassland. And we talked a lot about emotional things and aesthetic beauty. Well, I think one of the things that we're losing this right now, maybe the aesthetic beauty of seeing cows and calves out of grassland. Uh, it's a dying thing in this county. And uh, I, I guess I think there has to be some appreciation for that also. The next thing I would uh, appreciate reviewing would be the comments from the conceptual and interagency review teams. Specifically, I'd like to look at the Story County Engineer's comments. Uh, and I'm going to look at three of them specifically. Uh, one was keep the drainage within drainage district boundaries. Uh, three, avoid disturbing or building over district tile. Uh, four, that this will add over or 700 plus or minus cars on this uh, per day on 170th Street. Uh, the other night at the Planning and Development and Zoning Commission meeting, uh, Mr. Leo uh, gave a proposed solution for the drainage issues. And as you look at the current uh, projected division, uh, the eastern boundary has a road running along the entire eastern boundary. And if you will also notice, there's two major waterways that go through them. Uh, Mr. Leo tried to assure us that they would have adequate culverts to accommodate the water. Uh, I guess I have my doubts that they're going to be able to build a coffin big enough to accommodate a sudden torrential rain, uh, which leaves us with two options. One, the road will be graded high enough that we're going to create a dam. It's going to back water up into the surrounding fire ground, and it has the potential for crop damage that is over and above what would be occurring and would have occurred from that, such a torrential rain. Or, if the road is going to be graded low enough that the uh, 34 houses at the back of that subdivision are going to be cut off from access to 170th Street by floodwaters, which means very much you're not going to be moving around, ambulances are not going to be moving around, people or kids that have to go to school are not going to be moving around. Um, the other comment I think is fairly obvious to anyone here. We've got a busy farming market road. There are a lot of tractors and wagons go walking up and down that road to go with. And not just during harvest season. There are people hauling corn from, from
from storage drain, on-site storage, down the down road, you know, virtually all the time. Uh, 700 cars are going to create an obvious additional traffic hazard for the farm vehicles on the road. Now I'd like to turn some comment, to some comments from the Story County Planning and Development Department, uh, specifically to look at uh, their point four, uh, an agricultural residential zoning designation request is consistent with equal age, uh, a quarter mile south of the property with lot sizes in the Buck Hills subdivision, and consistent with lot sizes in the Buck Hills subdivision. Um, I won't dwell on this, but we've already looked at the fuzzy map. I mean, the report says 14 houses per quarter quarter. But now suddenly, with their plans, 14 houses per quarter quarter equals 19 houses per quarter quarter because if you divide 3 into 56, you come up with basically 19. We're talking about the revenue of 56 houses, but it's only going to be on 3 quarter quarters. So we're looking at a density of 19 houses per quarter quarter, which already is inconsistent with what we which is 14 houses. If you want to go to Mr. Uh, or Mr. Friedrich's proposal, we're looking at 27 houses per quarter quarter. Uh, I don't think anyone in the rural area is looking at really living in an urban setting, which this density would suggest to me. Um, and I also would like to say that applying and zoning development team and our staff did really, in their suggestion here, and say that the consistent thing between it and Buck Hills would be a rezoning to agricultural residential and not to transitional R1. Um, the next point I would like to make would be on point seven, uh, the C2C future land use map designation of this property, our agriculture cons conservative area and natural resource area. Agriculture conservation, conservative conservation aims to conserve agricultural land, direct future non-agricultural development towards the designated urban expansion, rural residential, rural village, and commercial industrial areas. Uh, I guess what I'd like to say here is I don't really understand why age fringe zone was developed, only to allow the developers who aims to move outside that fringe zone and start to develop urban density type developments. Uh, I, I would certainly hope that we could maintain an agriculture area as an agriculture setting. Uh, my wife and I went on the Story County Assessor site and looked at the Beacon maps. And we decided to define an area uh, with 170th Street being the north boundary, the County Line Road being the west boundary, the east boundary was 530th Avenue, which is the road running directly south from the Gilbert High School, and the south boundary was approximately a half mile south of Cameron School Road. And we just went through, and I'm sure we didn't get everything correct as far as my, my assumption would be we probably missed some properties. But we clicked on each individual property and put them in a spreadsheet and we just came up with how many acres in that approximately nine square miles is under the control currently of land developers. And it's over a thousand acres. That's a section and a half of that nine square miles. We're currently under the control of land. The next thing, this is a personal pet peeve of mine, I suppose, with the item 14. A maximum of 15% of the naturally occurring resources on the property may be removed for earth grading, roadway construction, building site clearance, or related construction activities. As I mentioned, I live in North uh, And I have observed what goes on in some of the, the, the uh, developments that are occurring in our area. And the first thing that's going to happen is the developer is going to come out with an earth and scrape all the black dirt off the road. And they're going to construct the roads, put in the necessary infrastructure, and they're going to start building their houses. And when they come back to regrade around those houses, there's going to be about three inches of dirt topsoil put back on that ground. And what you're going to end up with is a yard that has minimal moisture retention capability. A yard that after four or five days of hot weather in the summer, even potentially in four or five days after a previous inch of rain, you're going to have to be irrigated if you want to keep green water. Uh, my question would be if they can only remove 15% of the natural resources, who polices this? 
And I'm just going to make a, a very conservative estimate that there's a minimum of two feet of topsoil on that farm, everyone, including the pasture plants. So that would suggest to me if we're only going to remove 15%, they should be able to put approximately 20 inches back on the grade and around these houses. And my experience has been that's not the case. Uh, Mr. Johnson, can we get to the end? I, I so appreciate what you're talking about, but we're really getting off into the weeds for a rezoning request. We've got a huge day ahead of us, and I'm going to limit the next one. I'd just like us to get to the end. Okay. Uh, the question about plans to buffer the subdivision from the existing animal agriculture in the area, I really would like to see that reversed. And they've already talked about wanting to have this development be an area for young children. Uh, I guess my question would be, how do they intend to control pets that may have curiosity to get into a cattle yard? Uh, how about curious kids that want to get into a cattle yard? Who's going to control someone setting off fireworks? Cattle are very subject to sudden noises. Uh, is there going to be a permanent fence, a cattle type fence put around this residential uh, development? And are there going to be cattle gates and each access to 170? By that I mean uh, yeah, at grade cattle gates so that the cattle are not going to cross into that if they should happen to get out. Uh, finally, just quoting the statistics from the planning and development staff uh, on the existing land use in the area, 94.5% is agriculture. And 5.5% 5 .5, 5 is residential. Um, so again, I would ask if you're really putting any houses on the site is consistent <coughs> with the core stone to capstone uh, document, and if it's consistent with the principle of maintaining the rural character of the area. And again, as I mentioned for your review, unfortunately, uh, no one else can see this, but I do have two pictures at the end of my presentation that do show section one of Jackson Township in Boone County, meaning Black Hills Estate. In section seven of the budget. With the current ownership by the Yes, sir. Time. Yes, sir. Thank <coughs> you very much. And next I have uh, Rory Riley who would like to address us. <coughs> Rory, start by introducing yourself and, and I, I would uh, ask you to be as brief as possible. I will try and be. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Rory Riley. Uh, I live at the property at the northeast quarter quarter on the very east side of it. Uh, I've lived there since 1986. And I farmed the property for Bob Dotson for 25 years. So I'm kind of in a tough spot here myself. Uh, I'm on the opposite side of Bob. Bob's been a very fair and responsible of a landlord as a guy with everyone. So it's very hard for me to sit up here and say what I'm gonna say. I, I am in, my family is in the same type of situation as Bob's family is, not with the health problems, but I'm the youngest of nine. We have property on North Dakota, 160 acres. Uh, we're getting ready to the point where it's Belton's Cross Road, quarter mile north, is that, you know, we, we're thinking about selling. My sister's 73, she wants her money. So, is the time now to try and do the same thing with our property? I don't know. Uh, but just putting it up for sale doesn't make it uh, the reason to develop it, to me. You know, if, for whatever reason, and I feel sorry for Bob and his family, uh, you know, the, the rest of us that don't have that situation, if we run out of money or they run out of money, the state takes care of that. I'm sorry for this. It's the facts of life. Uh, as far as points of, of, of why I'm against it, uh, the, the farm is, is very productive as it stands right now. Uh, I just kind of went through some quick numbers. Right now, the row crop is from zero to $45 an acre of uh, profit at today's prices and yields that you know, we had this year. The farm land or the faster land is uh, between $125 and $150 of return per acre. 
granted there's less acres of pasture, so it takes, you know, but I make my living these days off of cattle and off the road crop. And I have 55 cows right next to that property. I have another pasture in Boone County, so it's not going to completely put me out of business. But I can't consciously have my, I always calve them there at home, all my cows, because you got to be there when it's calving time. And I learned something last year about cattle that I didn't know until I was 57 years old and 58 now. That uh, I've been often asked, you know, how come uh, coyotes never get into my calves? Well, and I even calve out on the pasture uh, if there's a late one, one or two a year. And I never lose one to a coyote. And I didn't know last year till what happens. I knew, I knew cattle could communicate. You call them, they tell all the rest of them, they all come on. Uh, but one of the, the calves like to sleep around the outside of that lot. I have electric fence. I got a very good track record of keeping my cattle, so they're not going to have to worry about my cattle getting over there. They said they got a 50 foot buffer zone. That's fine. Around the outside of my pen, I have a, or the inside, I have a, about a foot and a half electric fence. And that's where the calves like to lay because the cows don't step on them. It's dry in the spring. It keeps the cows from reaching through the fence. Uh, one of the calves was sleeping there, got up on the wrong side of the fence, which occasionally happens, but on the side to the development I have woven wire, which doesn't happen, but it happened on the south side. And well, I'll try to make this short, but what happened was I got on the other side of the fence, I laid the calf down like I always do, slid him back under the barbed wire. He gets up and gets into the electric fence. And I had never seen this before. I'd never heard my dad talk about heat race cattle, but that calf must have had a different try when he thought he was in serious. Every time he got shocked by the electric fence, I didn't have one cow on me like normally comes, or maybe a sympathetic cow. I had the whole damn herd on me, and I was actually scared. So, and this isn't too far-fetched, okay? Consciously, I couldn't have my cows there. Let's say there's some calves laying out there, and the cows are overeating, or are up the barns drinking water, and some curious, curious kids come over there, and either A, they want to pet the new little calf that's a day old that you can walk right up on, or B, uh, I dare you to go over there and pet that calf. Well, that calf gets up, he gets in that electric fence, and now he's got, these kids have three cows, on, or 55 cows on, and you got three children in there, you're gonna have a catastrophe on your hands. So that's why I can't consciously raise cattle at that farmstead if this proposal goes through and they start putting cows <coughs> I feel bad for Bob, and I want him to get the most money out of his property for his family, just as I want for my family when the day comes. But I just I can't be bored with that, and the traffic on the road, the, the problems we're having. With. I quit running my flashers on my tractors during the day because people from town, they do not pay attention. If your flashers are on all the time and you turn on your turn signal, you go, I, I've almost got hit three times in the last year, where if I don't watch out for them, they're going to hit me because I got my turn signal on. So what I've done now is I don't turn my flashes on during the day. I use the turn signal only. It has helped, but it's not a cure at all. So that's. Roy, thank you. John covered, Johnson covered some of the other points I had. Yeah. Okay, question for Boris. Um, so you are grazing your cattle, and the other, it sounds like, um, alternative that uh, Mr. Dawson is looking at right now is to put it in a confine and feed it up where do you have any thoughts about that? I'd welcome that before I was Thank you. Uh, next I have Terry Gallahan. <coughs> Terry, how are you this morning? I'm well, how are you, Rick? Good. I'm Terry Gallahan. I live in, in the town of Gilbert. I'm speaking for me, not necessarily city council. Okay. Um, I'm not happy about the threat of a hog confinement lot out there, but that's something way down the road if it happens, you know, that will be another meeting like this. Um, one, thing, one thing I thought about was the invasive plants. And I think about all of those, all of those homes and all of their lawns that are treated and where that runoff goes. Does it go into those areas? These, all those environmental areas, um, that, you know, there's a lot of invasive things. There's pet waste. There's going to be grass clippings dumped. Um, 
in those sensitive areas. Um, one big point for me is the fact that the two-inch main going into their water main is not big enough for fire control. Um, we saw from um, the presentation that <clears throat> it's Gilbert Township Fire Agency that controls that, which means the water has to be hauled. <coughs> Water that has to be hauled is more water comes from it's going to be, come from our water tower. Um, I worry about that. Um, I do worry about and, and again this is a development issue. It's not a zoning issue. I do worry about that quarter mile long Devian Road. Um, John talked about rain. Um, what if there's a tornado and it takes out right in the middle of that road? Those people are stuck there. They can't get in or they can't get out because it's a Devian Road. So um, that's kind of a big issue with that. Um, housing, um, I want to talk about the housing shortage. If we have a housing, housing shortage in Gilbert, um, I do want to de develop that, Marty, <laughs> that we talked about at the last meeting. Um, we just recently annexed almost 80 acres in the town of Gilbert. You want the kids to go to Gilbert school? Come to Gilbert. Pay, help us pay for our water bill at Gilbert. Um, I know that the school gets taxes when you're in the school district, but the town doesn't. And if there's 70 cars driving on that road, a lot of them are going to come into Gilbert. And they're going to, that's wear and tear on our roads. Um, parents bringing kids to school, parents going to kids to school functions. And we get no taxes from that because it's not <coughs> in the town. Um, so I'd rather, if, if we want more kids to go to the school, I'd rather they develop or they buy in that development, in that new almost 88 acre development. We also have other land in town, I'm not sure what it is, maybe 20 acres, that has not been, been, been developed on the west side of town. Um, it's another place to look. So I, there is land available, it doesn't have to take up the grazing land, um, the important grazing land. I guess that's it, that's all I had to say. I'm, I'm with John too on this kind of, this 14 houses per quarter quarter. It's like, well, we're only gonna develop three quarter quarters, but let's just take these 14 from the other quarter quarter and cram them up in the other three. I, I don't quite get that, but that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next I have uh, from, from. Go, Kathy Frog. <laughs> well, I do live in the county. I live between developments. And I spent a lot of time talking to developers, and I can sort of heard over here a friend. Uh, and we've known the Rileys for years uh, very well. Uh, we have been stewards of the, the 45 acres we own. I feel like this is fighting the last war, and I'll say why. Have you all heard of climate change? What climate change means is that we have to have density of population because the major issue is transportation. It is not unknown now that there are these problems. Why do you think the French people who are rural are, are protesting every weekend in France. That is because the French government raised the fuel tax and a carbon tax, and it falls on rural people because they have to drive more. Okay. This is a rural development. I can't say, I'm not saying I'm for or against it, I'm trying to say that in the future we face these problems, and that includes are we going to have buses, AIDS buses, going out to all these areas for people who cannot pay for the uh, tax that they're going to have to pay? Uh, we have increased the uh, road tax in California, uh, which was uh, <clears throat> approved by the population in a, in a referendum. Uh, but the point is, we face these issues, and we can't just decide that the rural life is very nice. Yeah, I do live there. Uh, it's quieter. Um, my husband hunts, and I know all of the issues. And they have done a very good job of managing the environmental issues. It seems to me like 
You couldn't ask for more. But the question is whether we can have rural development as rural as this really is. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so that brings me to the end of people who have requested to speak. Is there anyone else who would like to address this topic as part of the public hearing? Yeah, uh, Linda, go, and then Cindy will come to you. Thank you, and I apologize for not uh, signing up earlier. I would simply like to read a couple of things from the zoning ordinance, but first to say that I served on the County Planning and Zoning Commission for three years until last week I resigned because I'm going to another capacity. Um, we had training very early in that time. Thank you, Jerry, for putting that together and setting that up. And what I remember, and this isn't chapter and verse, but what I remember the trainer saying, who's an expert in zoning, is you folks aren't making things up, talking to us. You have a zoning ordinance. That is your law. You need to follow that law. Therefore, I would like to read <coughs> the definitions. And now definitions aren't perfect, you quite question them, but I see some differences in definitions here as you apply it to this land. The applicant is requesting R1. Reading from the zoning ordinance. The R1 transitional residential district is designed to provide a district for single family detached dwellings between a rural and urban density. And that goes back, I think, uh, to what Supervisor Olson said about is this leapfrogging? There is no higher density around this area that the applicant is asking to be R1. R1 in my mind is between, well it is here, it's between a more dense and a less dense. It's a transition zone. That doesn't apply to this land in my mind. The, then, the AR, Agricultural Residential District, is designed to provide for single family detached dwellings with limited activities interrelated with agricultural uses at a rural density. It goes on, and I didn't write it all down, but it goes on to explain the kind of things that you do to make sure that the agricultural and the residential um, uses are adequately buffered, whatever. So when I'm looking at this personally and my time on zoning, um, planning and zoning commission, it seemed to me when we voted on this that R1 was not appropriate. I did not see it being a transition. I saw this being more of an AR. Yeah, and, and, and that's I, all I wanted to say, and we have somebody else who wants to talk. Absolutely, I just wanted to ask a question, uh, and I so appreciate you, you bringing this up. It looks to me like this is being proposed, Linda, as kind of a hybrid, because the true R1, and Jerry, you helped me through this, but that's a half acre density. 25,000 square feet. Roughly a half acre, right? Uh, an acre is 48,000 square feet. Um, so, so a half acre density. And what I'm hearing being proposed is half acre lots, which is the reason for the R1 request, but at a density that is much less than a one home per half acre. I mean, no matter how you slice it, whether you slice it by the quarter quarter or by the number of developable acres or the full number of acres, we're much less density than what R1 would truly be, right? We're talking about somewhere between 56 and 81 homes on a 160 acre site that's much less than R1, but agricultural residential requires one acre minimum lot size. And what I'm hearing proposed is we don't want, or, or the developer doesn't want one acre lot sizes because it would be cost prohibitive to draw the kind of homeowners that they're looking to, to draw. And I'm just asking you, so you, so you read the definition of it. The zoning ordinance allows you to um, create or invent a hybrid. The zoning ordinance says what the zoning ordinance says. Absolutely true. But the zoning ordinance does not require that you, so if you lay the AR on it and you say, or the R1 on it, and you say half acre uh, size lots, but it doesn't say how many lots you have to have. In other, in other words, you don't have to fill up the whole property with it, but if you go to the AR, your minimum is one acre lot sizes. And that's the problem with it. Plainly, I asked Mr. Dodson <clears throat> when he was going to do this property, it sounds like it's going to be either or. How would you like to see this board vote? <coughs> the 
consistent with the zoning ordinance. So you're asking us to deny it? I'm just asking you to look at the zoning ordinance. I did vote against this the Planning and Zoning Commission because I did not feel like our one was appropriate. I didn't think it fit the definition. But you are making your own decisions here. Um, I think that it needs to be, that the decisions need to be based on the zoning ordinance. If we don't base decisions on a zoning ordinance, we don't have a zoning ordinance. Completely agree. Thank you. Cindy, I saw you move the microphone. Yes, thank you. Um, I will be short. I am um, a prairie fanatic and have been for many years. I am not going to get what I want um, out of any decision that is possible here today. Um, so I'm looking at the options. And I see an option of CAFO, which I don't like for that site. I see the option, and they wouldn't have to have any kind of permission to do this, of putting, say, three big expensive houses on there. And if one of them decides that he wants a 35-acre lot that turns into a tree farm, the second one wants the mountain bike trails, and the third one wants the biggest mowed lawn in the world. There goes the prairie. So of the rock and the hard place that I see, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I would prefer to have the rezoning with all the conditions that were recommended by planning and zoning, and with further negotiation with the developer to make things as good as possible for the prairie. Um, if I thought things could remain the way they are now, I wouldn't be saying that. But it's pretty clear to me that they won't. And so between the rock and the hard place, I guess I'm picking reluctantly the hard place. Thank you. Cindy, thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to address us as part of the public hearing uh, for the zoning, rezoning request? Last chance? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, turn to the board for further conversation uh, and options. Board questions or comments based on what we've heard? Um, I don't want a confinement, confinement operation there. That's Sorry for all of you out there. Okay? Um, I do uh, understand uh, Supervisor Sanders' rationale about um, the half acre as the, um, the total of it. I like the fact that there is a park there in land that's already in conservation reserve. I appreciate um, that we're possibly looking at 70 acres instead. Um, Cindy, I hope you get some of your remnant plants. Um, I talked to our naturalist and I see that our director of conservation is in the back room. I know they're going to try their darndest to keep some of those preserved, but also they have big challenges ahead of them, as was referenced on water, and there's a lot that Mother Nature does, and then people come in and do on top that can affect that. Uh, natural prairies, uh, especially if they're just remnants. So I'm not really factoring that in. Um, I'm a little bit still in shock that 350,000 is an affordable house, but then, you know, me and I, my affordable housing that I try to work on is really lower than that. Um, my biggest fear is that it, of the leapfrogging actually, that then the next 160 acres is going to get sold and then there's going to be some somebody come in and use this as the example. But I'm willing to consider with the 70 uh, houses down to the 70, the septic system would have to be a condition for me to vote yes um, for those areas where you could have one common collection and run your laterals off of that. Um, I am going to reference something that I'm reminded not to reference in a long time, but I was a journalist for a long time here, so I've covered development in this county since 2002, and I have seen the development community um, sometimes really dig in their heels, and Kurt Friedrich has not done this. The opposite has happened, is he's really tried to meet as many goals as he could and still take what is a very unique piece of property. Um, with the, the top topography of it. So that's where I'm going to stand, and I can make a motion, or anybody else want to comment? If, if we could talk for just a minute sure. more before you, Marty, anything you want to No, I think Cindy Hillbrand did a fine job of speaking where my mind has gone on this. I think Mr. Dodson does this out of necessity for his family, and I respect that. I think quite possibly this is a stretch. I understand that this would be bit of a burden and a hardship to the city of Gilbert, which I think Gilbert will grow to, is the likelihood they will grow this way. 
is, you know, as we're watching them grow to the south, as you're seeing the infill with the <coughs> urban ground there in North High School, it's a community that is expanding. This is probably a little further than I would like to see it too. Don't disagree, but I think that uh, if you look at the 2018 ice, I think we will miss one. In fact, it will be counted. Gary Hamlin. Um, Larso, so I'm, I'm going to tell you where I think I am and what I think I heard you say okay. to see if that's where we are. So um, I am moving toward approval of the rezoning with conditions as presented, except amending condition one, and in condition one talks about the whole quarter quarter, and it, and to me it was that's kind of a convoluted reference point. I don't know anywhere the county has referenced density per quarter quarter before, and so I threw out there the possibility of no more than one uh, developable lot per acre of total development ground, understanding that they're gonna be half acre lots instead of acre lots, which gives us more more open space, right? Which is the seven that you referenced. And so I'm suggesting that conditions, all the conditions that are here, um, be what we put forward. But no, the first condition, which is the overall density of future subdivision, shall be consistent with the density of Eagle Ridge subdivision, not to exceed 14 development lots per quarter quarter. We just change that to the overall density of the future subdivision shall not be more than one developed lot per total net acres of development property. Total net acres. <laughs> Thinking that we're taking out, so it's 160 total acres, but really what we're interested in is what's developable, which, Kirk, what I'm hearing is about 70 acres. Is that right? So 70 acres. And I would, I, that's where I am. That's what I heard you saying. Marty, I, I kind of hear you along that direction. I just want to see if we're getting anywhere close because then we need to reword that one condition. Okay. Um, yes, we're very, very close. Um, I just really, I'm looking, I saw Margaret James at one point here. Oh, there she is way back in the hall. Just to make sure what's the best way, Margaret, to handle the uh, condition about septics when possible, especially on some of those larger ones. You want to put in conditions, or is that something that can be handled during the plan review process? Margaret James, Environmental Health. A um, couple options out there. One is to have um, on sites for each and every one. Another one is to have on sites and allow laterals to be in the green space. And the third one is to um, pipe it so that it all comes down to a lower point in the landscape. And we have one large package plant, and, um, and it gets charged to the, uh, the lower area there. The advantage to that third option is that it would take the, all of that water past that um, sensitive zero zone of, for the plants, and it wouldn't overwater them per se. I'm not sure I heard Kurt offer that option. What I think um, I heard. Uh, Mr. Friedrich's offer was forced in some of the locations um, around some of or where it would direct the water to the remnants that he would be willing to look at maybe a dual or four fourplex. I don't. I'm sure that's not the right word, but to, for those sites, and then the rest would be the single. Is that what I heard? Lars, I heard common discharge okay. possible taking into account that we don't want to overwater some of these drier <coughs> prairie areas because the real benefit to conservation, Mike's standing in the back of the room, and Mike, I'm just going to ask you to affirm if I'm saying this correctly. The real potential benefit to conservation is if we can preserve these native plant species, and the reality is on the higher end, if they get too much water, we're going to lose them anyway. Okay. Yeah. One thing I really want to add, I, I say this proposals is that we are adding a lot of water to that small mini watershed if you will. It's 300 gallons to about 700 gallons or even more if they're um, irrigating their lawns per lot. So that's that's a lot of water being added to that area. That's the problem with the density. If you get the higher density, you're going to get more water. Thank you, Margaret. So um, if 
the condition added would be uh, to work with our environmental health and planning and zoning department uh, for common collection, uh, common cluster collection uh, uh, system for four to six homes uh, as able. <coughs> that is a condition that I would like to add, correct? Oh yeah, all right. Um, common cluster, or cluster, mm -hmm. common cluster collection uh, system uh, that would uh, have uh, laterals uh, for four to six, single laterals for four to six homes on collection. Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, would you mind just restating the first condition to sit on? We talk yeah, about let's let's talk total dwellings or to, total number of developable lots shall not exceed the total number of developable acres. <coughs> right, the intent being that we're taking those 90, I don't want the fuzzy math, so if we're taking 90 acres out of this thing, the, the perceived fuzzy math, how about that? Um, we take 90 acres out of this thing, we're really talking about 70 developable acres. So let's just keep it clean. We know that the reason that we want to move to the R1 is so that they can be half acre lots, they don't have to be acre lots, but we don't want the density that would be on, on 70 acres, it'd be 140 developable lots according to the R1. We don't want that kind of density. Could, could that be, say, uh, to a maximum of 70? Developable yeah. that there that good. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Now we'd be ready for a motion with conditions as stated. I make a motion that we approve the rezone and the map um, uh, adjustment. Screen went down. Um, with the conditions as stated today. Second. We got a motion and a second. Jerry and Emily, are you clear on what we moved and seconded here? Hey, we're quite clear. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? None. None. Olson? Aye. Chitty? Aye. Sanders? Aye. It passes with conditions. Thank you very much. All right. This will be back before you next week at the Morrison Fraser's meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay.